Hi, everybody. Welcome back to uh, another Bible study. An exciting day today. We are finishing up 2 Kings. Now, I do have to give a warning. There is a small gaggle of girls uh, looking to be about five, six downstairs, all wearing pink Barbie outfits with a baby doll, a unicorn that is wearing a diaper, and they are seemingly fighting over possession of the unicorn. And so there's no telling what you could be hearing in the background of this video. Uh, all I know is it can't be as bad as the rooster. So <laughs> with that, that'll probably be the cheeriest part of our video. Unfortunately, the last chapter of 2 Kings is not a good one. It tells us about kind of the culmination of the nation of Judah's evils and disobedience against the Lord. So let's get into it. As most of you know by now, you can download these PDFs on our website, and now you can get the whole book of 2 Kings available for free. There's a link down in the description, and hopefully we'll have a physical book out soon. Check the description, maybe that will be out by the time that you're watching this, if you're watching it later. As we always do, let's talk about when these events happened. Well, Zedekiah, he's the last king of Judah who we were talking about. Zedekiah was put on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar, but he rebelled against the Babylonian Empire, so his reign spans from 597 to 586 BC. 586 is when and Jerusalem and the temple are going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. We have quite an expansive map to talk about. First of all, the kings of Judah reigned from Jerusalem. You'll see that on the map. The kings of Babylon reigned over a vast empire. The capital, though, was the city of Babylon along the Euphrates River. Now, we do want to mention Jericho as well. We've talked about that in the past. It's not on the map, but it sits between Jerusalem and the Jordan River. It's just to the east of Jerusalem. And our final character section in 2 Kings is, once again, made up of kings. That seems fitting. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Jehoiachin, he became king after Jehoiakim. He only reigned for three months, and then he was taken captive to Babylon. We'll talk about him at the end of our chapter, uh, several years after that took place. Zedekiah. Zedekiah was Nebuchadnezzar's kind of puppet king. He was put in place over Judah, but he rebelled against Babylon. That's going to have devastating consequences. Then a guy who has a really interesting name, Evil Merodach. Evil Merodach is the son of King Nebuchadnezzar, who would take the throne of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar, and he releases Jehoiakim from prison in Babylon decades after Jehoiakim's taken there. Again, we'll talk about that at the end of the outline. Quick update on the situation outside. The baby dolls appear to be having surgery performed on them, and the unicorn with the diaper is missing. I don't know if he was barbecued or he was put back in his stall for bad behavior. As I mentioned in the last chapter, and it's true of this chapter as well, this is a really significant chapter in the history of Judah. That date 586, when Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed, and that we're going to talk about here, that's one worth remembering. It's kind of a landmark on the timeline of the Old Testament. It's the, the beginning of the period known as the Babylonian exile for Judah, where they're going to get kicked out of the Promised Land and sent to Babylon for several decades. So just keep that in mind. This is quite a significant event. We're also going to see basically the capital of Judah. Well, yeah, the capital of Judah and really the, the center point of the promised land, the place where the temple is and the temple itself are going to be destroyed in this chapter. So don't skip over this chapter and think it's insignificant. It's it's very, very significant in the history of the, the, the people of Judah. Now let's talk about the consequences of Zedekiah's rebellion. Verses 1 through 21, Jerusalem is destroyed and more of Judah is exiled to Babylon. So in Zedekiah's ninth year as king, after he had rebelled, Nebuchadnezzar came against the city of Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The siege lasted several years until Zedekiah's 11th year, and there was great famine, great starvation in the city as a result of the siege because they couldn't get food into the city because it was surrounded by an enemy army. Eventually, the city was breached, and everyone inside, the people of Judah, including the king, tried to escape, many to the east. Zedekiah did manage to get out of the city, but ultimately he was captured at the plains of Jericho. Now, the Babylonians didn't mess around when it came to punishing traitors. Zedekiah was punished very harshly. His sons were killed in front of him, and then his eyes were put out. He was blinded, so the last thing that he saw was the death of his sons. Now, in Nebuchadnezzar's 19th year as king, his servants went to Jerusalem. They burned the city. They tore down the wall all around the outside, and they took more captives away to Babylon. So Jerusalem is ruined at this point, not just Jerusalem, but also the Lord's temple that was originally built by Solomon. The temple was burned. All of the bronze, the silver, the gold, the furniture within the temple was taken away to Babylon. And then it, that also included the large bronze pillars which sat outside of the holy place. And those were pretty large, uh, significant 
structures. As you'll remember, if you remember when we talked about the, the creation, the designs of the temple. So pretty much at this point, the temple has been stripped of everything that makes it or made it significant. Nebuchadnezzar killed the high priest. He killed the second priest and any government and military officials that he found in the city. And verse 21 reads like this, quote, so Judah was taken into exile out of its land. Israel has now been taken by the Assyrians and scattered. Judah is now taken out of the promised land and taken to Babylon. They're going to be there for several decades. There's going to be a remnant that returns and God is going to work through that remnant. But again, that's about 50 years out at this point. Section number two, verses 22 through 26, Gedaliah is made the governor of Judah. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't exile everybody from Judah. He left the extremely poor people in the land. And so he appointed a governor, you know, again, a kind of a puppet governor over these very poor people who remained in Judah. Gedaliah told the people that they didn't have anything to fear as long as they served the Babylonian Empire, but a man named Ishmael and his band of 10 men ended up assassinating Gedaliah. Maybe they thought that he was a traitor for working with the Babylonians. This led many in Judah to flee to Egypt to live there because they feared the retribution of the Babylonian Empire, which was probably a reasonable fear. I believe in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about these individuals who fled to Egypt. Now our final section in 2 Kings verses 27 through 30, Jehoiachin gets out of prison in Babylon. So this skips forward several decades, 37 years into his Babylonian imprisonment. Jehoiachin, who was the former king of Judah, was released from prison by this king named Evil Merodach, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son who took the throne after him. Evil Merodach elevated him in his kingdom, and Jehoiachin often ate at the king's table. So. He uh, goes from spending a lot of years in prison to towards the end of his life being somewhat elevated in the kingdom of Babylon. And so that is the book of 2 Kings. It's not the easiest book to read. It's kind of depressing. You know, we see the, the nations of Israel and Judah fall apart. But that kind of leads us into our understanding the Bible section here as we finish up. Do you remember all the way back during the days of the prophet Samuel? He was a judge in Israel. When the people of Israel asked Samuel to give them a king, Samuel said, this is something that's going to displease God, but they insisted, we want a king. So God said, you know what? They haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me, but I am going to give them a king. How's that working out for them? Was a king really what this nation needed? They rejected God as their king in exchange for a human king. And as we've, as we've followed the story of Judah and Israel over the last several centuries, we've learned that their kings were pretty lousy and they led their nations into a great deal of shame. But this is not where the story ends. We're in the middle of the Old Testament. We have the rest of the Old Testament to get through. And as we read through the rest of the Old Testament, we will await a better king. Someone who's going to fix these broken governments and someone who's going to be resistant to the immorality that corrupted so many of the kings of Israel and Judah. Spoiler alert, that king who we're waiting for is Jesus. The people rejected God as their king and they messed up their nations. God, Jesus, is going to return to his people to show them that God is the only one who's capable of saving them. He's the only one who's fit to be their king. And so that is the book of 2 Kings. Lord willing, very soon we'll be starting Chronicles and finishing that one up. I'm going to take the rest of the week off because I'm behind on some of my other work. But Lord willing, next week we will pick up in Chronicles and finish that off and move on into the Old Testament, moving towards the better king, Jesus.